Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Tom Nugent of Knives by Nuge. I recently came across uh, Knives by Nuge while doom scrolling on Instagram two EDC fixed blades, something I love and I've been into a lot recently. After that, Tom's knives kept popping up in my feed, so I gave him a follow and was immediately impressed by his beautiful little fixed blades, great for in-the-pocket carry with an ulti clip or the like. But his range is also impressive for a new maker with designs from EDC to camp to kitchen and recently i saw a knife by nuge that had a pleasingly tactical bent we'll meet tom and talk about his knives and some big news that he's just recently announced but before we do be sure to like and comment subscribe hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can listen on the go and as always if you're interested in supporting the show um you can do so by going to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to uh, scan the QR code or go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Like I like I mentioned in the uh, intro, um, I've been on a real uh, fixed blade kick, uh, especially after years of being really into the flippers and such. And uh, besides giant Bowie knives, I love EDC fixed blades. So I was really uh, kind of drawn in by your work. Uh, beautifully done. Uh, I want to I want to say congratulations on an announcement you recently made on your Instagram feed. I want to um, I want to say that. Uh, what was that announcement? So that announcement is that I'm going full time now with knife making, which is uh, it's pretty huge. It's pretty scary. But, uh, you know, I'm very happy with the decision. I'm happy where everything's ending up. And, uh, yeah, I used to be a full time police officer in New Jersey, and I just handed in my resignation this Monday. So, uh, <laughs> Wow. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. It's mixed emotions, you know, because that's something that I dedicated like a third of my life preparing for working and then, you know. It's funny how things work out, but I have a real passion for this. And, you know, I can't with all the shift work and everything else, as you can imagine, being a police officer, you didn't have a lot of time for sleep on top of also running a business. So one had to give. And I think I really found my passion and we're going to roll with it. Oh, man, that sounds great. It sounds like you're a free man. And uh, it's I know uh, our our police uh our police um, departments, you know, are struggling these days uh, because, you know, I know their hours are insane and and numbers are down. Um, so I could see how uh, working on an outside, working on a side passion or on a on a project, a business, could be nearly impossible with that kind of schedule. Uh, New Jersey, what uh, what was it like being a police officer in in New Jersey? Uh, it's interesting to say the least. Um, it's not the most friendly work environment all the times, but, uh, you know, you learn how to deal with a lot of these things. And, uh, the biggest thing you learn is like how to deal with people. And that's, you know, dealing with like I'm dealing with a customer or anything like that is never an issue. It's like, it's never as bad as like an issue I have with the person at work, you know, because yeah. at the end of the day, nobody's trying to kill me over a knife, you know, it's, yeah. uh, I was uh, actually having a conversation with someone the other day talking about the pros and cons of uh, going to this. And then he had to remind me, yeah, you're also not going to get shot. And I'm like, oh, that's a, a uh, cool perk. <laughs> no kidding. I I, uh, I work around police, you know, sort of adjacent uh, from time to time. And I'm amazed by how composed they are when I would when I would probably just lose my patience. Uh, so I, I, I bet there's there's a lot to learn there. But so. So the knife making came out of where? Where where have where did you get this love of knives? So I've always been into knives. I mean, everybody's got the same kind of origin story. I mean, I remember my first knife that I actually really cherished was uh, it was an old Gerber that I found on the side of the Delaware River after my pack got dumped down the river after our canoe flipped. And that was the only thing I had for the rest of the trip. So uh, I kept that thing and cherished it for a while. But the guy who uh, got me into making knives was actually a buddy I trained jiu-jitsu with. I met him through uh, 
over in Henzo Gracie in Northvale, New Jersey. And uh, it was one of those things where he's like, you know, you could probably do this. You're pretty handy. And we started messing around. And then I got more into it. He had twins. He stopped being so into it. And then, uh, yeah, it spiraled to where we are today. So uh, is is this uh, someone who actually showed you the ropes in terms of how to, you know, how how to how to make knives from scratch? Yep. Not really. We were uh, we're both YouTube babies when it came to this. Okay. And uh, I haven't had any professional training or anything like that, which is why I probably still have very serious imposter syndrome. <laughs> but uh, I mean, even being here today, I was just yeah. watching your uh, interview with Winkler. And I'm like, what am I doing on this thing right now? There's, <laughs> there's some greats on here. And I'm just some guy who watched some internet videos and figured out how to do it. Well, that's uh, that's funny. Uh, imposter syndrome is very common. Um, not just not just you know for knife makers, and it's just very common in general. But it's funny uh, because everyone who's ever been on this show has been has made interesting knives, and and they all and, and that's usually my entree. I see their work and i'm like wow let's talk about this uh because i am a knife junkie and I, that's what i want to talk about and then it's amazing to see what the backstories are to people uh so you you make beautiful knives and that's why you're here i want to find out what your backstory is and uh you know there are a lot of people who listen to the show who are teetering on the verge of where you are making that big uh jump uh so what what kind of decision is that to make i mean um, you know, you have something, uh, very steady and sure with a government job like police work. So what, what really was the impetus? Well, I mean, other than like benefits and cost analysis and everything else like that, one thing that I, uh, I learned very quick in law enforcement, uh, life isn't always guaranteed. Um, and length of terms and happiness really kind of matter. Because uh, I won't go into details, but I had a couple stories that like really stuck with me where you're like, you know what? You never know what you really got. So I, with a lot of cops, they just they try to grit their teeth and bear through with their career for a hope of a retirement at the end. But they don't live their life during it, you know, and uh, I saw this as a, something that, you know, I won't probably become a, you know, lavishly rich man by making knives. However, I could see my life being way more enjoyable, being passionate about what I do with other people that are super passionate about the product. So, you know, it just seems a little more fulfilling than just trying to like, you know, bear with it for another 24 years and then hopefully have a retirement at the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. And hopefully make it those 24 years. Of course, there's no guarantees anywhere. Uh, but when you're wearing a gun and a badge, you know, your chances, uh, you know, they go up. Uh, so what about your, um, your fellow police officers? Uh, as they saw your love of knives and knife making begin to bud and and then your skills begin to grow uh, what was it like being around because those are all guys who have tools and utility belts and and uh, i'm sure most of them have an appreciation for knives uh, so what was it like um being in the police department and starting that that hobby which now has become your career well, one thing that I learned about cops and guys that are in law enforcement and girls is that uh, they are terrible to their gear. So whatever it is, it better be durable. And another thing I realized is they want simple. Um, that one that you mentioned before, the more uh, tactical-esque knife that I was showing you, yeah. I actually designed that with a police officer that I went to the academy with. Uh, it's called the CF3. It's this guy right here. Sorry, I've got terrible lighting in here. But... Uh, it's a ringtail karambit style knife with, you know, more of a standard blade to it because mm -hmm. I just me and him came up with this design because uh, he was actually shot in the line of duty. And when he was shot, the guy was on top of him, so he couldn't access his firearm is the guy's hip was over his gun. And the other party was able to get his gun out of his waistband. Thankfully, he's still here, but he wanted something that he could wear on his chest simple to pull out you put your finger in there you know where the business end is yep. and just use it to create distance but the reason why i did the blade shape the way it is right here is because it's more of a utilitarian blade because the same guy who got the prototype and designed it with me he told me the first day with his prototype he actually used it but not in a you know tactical fighting scenario right. there's a gentleman who had a heart attack on the street in jersey city 
and it was the dead of winter. I think it was February. And he used a blade to cut through all four layers of clothing and they were able to slap an AED on him and uh, bring him back. So nice. it's, I realize with this kind of stuff, like you have very little real estate to actually put gear on. I mean, you would love to carry everything that you can, but then you won't be able to move or function. So I wanted to create a knife that was, you know, simple enough to carry and useful for a multitude of purposes. And also simple if you really need to deploy it because knife fighting is tough. I am no knife fighting expert. That's why I just want things simple to work like that. And also if you want to use it as a utility, it fits perfectly in the hand right there. And uh, that's what I really learned from law enforcement. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, you mentioned jujitsu before. That uh, that kind of knife with a ring is probably handy. Well, it sounds like it was a grappling situation uh, that really gave birth to that idea in the first place. Um, I, I have a I have mixed feelings about about rings. I've I've done a little bit of karambit training in the kali stuff I've done, and I find it to be very um, uh, very. You have to have a very, very high level of training, in my yeah. opinion, uh, to do anything than just kind of slash away with a karambit. And and at that rate, I would prefer uh, a pickal style, you know, with the tip down and yeah. the edge in for that kind of caveman, you know, gross motor stuff. The ring is what kind of throws me for a loop sometimes because I... I always think of it uh, in terms of all the fancy flipping people do with the crambits when they want to show off. But you raise the very interesting point, and 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 you know, um, this this is where the ring really comes in handy, just to be able to blindly kind of find what you're looking for, put your finger through, and pull it out. And uh, you, you might scrape your finger, but you can worry about that later. Really, uh, you need to have that thing in hand. Well, another very handy part about the ring is it's not to, you know, swing it around and look cool and everything like that, even though you can. Um, and there's been many a midnight tour where I just caught myself flinging this thing around. Um, never cut myself. But um, it's because when I was wearing this on my outer carry, it was very tight to my chest because you don't want it very loose saying out there, come grab me. So to get like a good grip in the finger, sometimes I could only get my finger in that much. And I could still pull it out and then get my full master grip on the thing. Right. So it kind of helped keep it tucked away because, I mean, anytime you get into a fight, especially wearing that much gear, it turns into a yard sale where all your items on your chest rig or on your waistband just go flying all over the place. So I wanted something that was secure and tight because that's one of those things that if you really need it, it's like, it's like a parachute, you know? You really need it. You need it at that moment. And if you don't have it ready to go, yeah. You're probably not going to run into a chance of needing it again. Yeah, it's curtains. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter if you have a good knife on you or not. So as a at uh, in that situation, in those kind of tactical situations, um, you know, those kind of things come up a lot in discussions on this uh, on this program. But unless I have a law enforcement or martial arts expert or military person on, it, it's hypothetical. So from your perspective and your experience, uh, when these kind of uh, uh, how how often do these kind of hand to hand uh, tussles kind of come up? It must be somewhat frequent because you're you're not drawing your gun as much, I would imagine, as you are laying hands on people to control them. You need to be much better with your hands than you do. Actually, the best thing you could do is be good with your words. I mm. can't tell you how many times I've stopped fights from just you know talking them down and being reasonable people and listening to what they're saying. Um, that's the most important part. But, you know, that's hard to train. Um, at least jujitsu, you could sign up for classes for that kind of stuff. And personally, that's the best way I think it is to handle most situations when you can. Obviously, if there's weapons involved, you, you got to do what you got to do um, to keep everybody safe. But hand to hand combat is probably the one, of, you know, a lot of guys are lacking it. But you can't blame them because, you know, they don't have the time for the training or the money. Jujitsu is expensive every month. I pay a good amount of money every month to go to it. And uh, it takes up a lot of time. So then you involve having bills, overtime, a wife, kids, you know, and then you sprinkle in, you know, another 20 hours of jujitsu a week. It's it's tough and not everybody has the time for it. So, you know, personally, I wish they had more in schedule training for that kind of stuff. 
Well, uh, that's you know, I'm sorry. That's exactly what I was going to say. That's not something a police officer should be seeking out in an extracurricular kind of way. That's something that should be coming through departmental training. It, I mean, I'm not saying that you, you got to go through a full five belt, you know, Brazilian jiu jitsu course. But I mean, something that that that's trained on a regular basis so that people so that police officers don't feel like they have to go for the deadly force. Uh, no. yeah. And it, it gives them confidence, too. Because there were, you know, I would never like, you can't underestimate anybody because you never know what their actual skills are. Yeah. However, when most things were getting heated, it just kind of, you know, knowing that you have some training in your back pocket and you probably won't die that easily, you know, it kind of makes you feel a little more calm in the situation. And it's not like a tombstone courage kind of thing, but it's like, all right, I could probably hold my own for a bit. So maybe I still have time to talk this down and work it out before, you know. It goes crazy because the one thing I did notice is guys and girls who always bark the loudest normally have the softest punch. So it's like it's always the quiet guy you got to be watchful for. Those, that's normally the guy who knows what's going on. You are not the first person I've heard say that or the first law enforcement officer, former uh, in this case, that I've heard say that. And that's uh, that's something to keep in mind. You know, it can be intimidating when someone's shouting you down but keep your eyes peeled for his friend lurking in the corner, you know? It's always the quiet types that get you. So uh, let's talk about some of the some of the knives. Beside, first of all, what is this, uh, the ring knife called? So that's called the CF3. That's actually, uh, it's dedicated to a Jersey City police officer who lost his life in 2019 in the shooting that happened there. So uh, Detective Joseph Seal is what his name after. The guy I designed it with, he was actually partners with them. So that's why uh, we call it the CF3. And it comes in two different sizes. It comes in this standard size. And then uh, it comes in an XL because I realized people have uh, gigantic hands compared to my little baby hands. So I had to make two sizes. <laughs> that's funny, man. Yeah, that's one of those things I do every time I get a new knife. I'll bring it to the office and there are several people there with giant hands. Like, How does this feel in your hand? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so that's cool. But uh, so let's talk about some of the other knives, the ones that really... Um, uh, the ones that I saw first that really captured my heart. And some of them are really small, actually. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, I am not an outdoorsman. I I, I, I aspire to one day be one uh, because I, I think, well, it doesn't matter why. Uh, your knives, I notice, have a really nice Scandi grind on them, beautiful handles, and uh, uh, sort of a, a, a bushcraft camping kind of vibe kind of steering away from the police conversation tell me about the knives the main kind of uh the knives that are the ones that you work on the most and tell me where they come from and and uh and that so i've uh, i've always been a big outdoorsman it's always really been my passion and i always even when i was still a police officer i always consider so i kind of forgot i was a cop at times um because I really just enjoyed the outdoors more. I got heavily involved with the Boy Scouts back in the day. That's where it all kind of really started. And then afterwards, I just did like a deep dive into all sorts of fishing, hunting. I've worked in outdoor retail for years. That was the biggest problem because I would try a new hobby every other month. And if you saw my basement right now, I could probably open up an outdoor shop with the night. <laughs> uh, we wouldn't be able to live where we live with that if I didn't have that basement to store all my junk. But, uh, so, yeah, I got a little bit of experience in everything from like fly fishing, surf fishing, out Montauk and everything like that. Oh. A lot of camping, a lot of wilderness survival prep and everything like that. So that's kind of where my passion really is with the knives, because that's what I use the most. And I was even thinking about it earlier this morning that like having a knife is one of the most personal things you could have out there, because if you're into bushcraft, that's your number one tool. If you're into hunting. That is what you get, you know, you're celebrating when you take that thing out because you just right. actually, you got a piece, you got, you finally did it. And it's like, it's that physical connection to everything. So that's, as you can see, like where I really perk up is with these kind of knives. Um, even though I do have a culinary line because I love to cook, but I would say the outdoor stuff is really my jam. Camp Toku. I like that. <laughs> well, that's, that's one. That's uh, this guy right here. I did a uh, so that's kind of where my culinary line and my uh, outdoor line mesh together. So as you can see, it's got more of a Santoku shape and also yeah. that Nesmic style head. But and this one's tough because like it's hard to market 
because you can't just really see the difference. It's a fine difference. On the edge there, I take the tip much thinner than I do the back here. So back here, you could do all your batoning down there and your finer chopping and slicing up front. So I haven't found a good way to really advertise and market that, but I'll get there one day. But super <laughs> comfortable knife. I baton this through plenty of hardwoods and then started cooking right afterwards with it. What's the uh, width on that? So this is a 332nd stock. So fairly okay. thin, but I mean, that's the same kind of stuff that Mora uses. And I don't think anybody right. can say a Mora knife isn't tough. Yeah, no kidding. And and what kind of steel? So uh, do you work in a range of steels uh, depending on what the use is? Or do you kind of stick to, to uh, the same things for outdoors knives? I kind of stick to the same with my culinary and outdoor knives. Um, my culinary knives, I just do Nitro V because it's simple and it's good. And I think it's got a great structure to it. Um, and I've never had any issues with it. And it's always the engineering fallacy of uh, what is the best steel. And I am no steel nerd by any means. Um, but it's I know it's a good, tough steel that's easy to sharpen for most customers. And even I had a customer recently, he wanted a whole kitchen set. And he said, I want the best steel possible. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold up. Because I'm like, do you want to be able to sharpen them yourself? And he's like, I would like to. I'm like, all right, well, let's let's bring it back a little bit then. Because I could get you like the best, toughest, most wear resistant steel. But good, good luck sharpening it yourself after you start hitting the ceramic dinner plates with it. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. But, uh, we Mainly I'm Nitro sorry. V. Sorry, I jumped in. Nitro V and 1095 is what I really use for most of the outdoor stuff. So... uh uh, the grinds now am i correct on a lot of the smaller knives uh these are scandy grinds you're putting in yeah a lot of scandy grinds um i like the scandy grind a lot i still think it's a very versatile grind especially with a thinner stock because you still mm -hmm. with that thin stock you still have a very slicey knife yeah the um uh, uh scandinavian grinds and chisel grinds i i've I really grown to, they're like exotic birds to me. And, and, uh, I use them on occasion. I have a bunch of Emerson's, so they're all chisel ground. Uh, but, uh, the, these, these kind of edges seem more acute to me. Um, you know, the chisel grind is like kind of, uh, like a Scandi grind, but just half of it. So it just seems like you're, uh, by not having that final relief edge, you're just kind of getting, straight to it but why is that preferred in bushcraft like say over an apple seed edge which i know is or a convex edge which i know is also uh very common and popular in outdoor edges so it essentially acts as a wood chisel and for most bushcraft tasks that's what you're using is you're cutting wood you're manipulating wood that's really the the medium you're using to make most of your tools and other structures and everything is wood so it's very important to be able to cut through that very well. Some people actually with the scandy grind have a hard time getting a good feather stick just because of how much it bites quickly into the wood. Uh -huh. So it really takes a little bit of finesse because it can really dig in there quick. But if you're trying to hog away material, especially if you're doing like a chest lever grip, you can really just shred wood with this kind of grind. So uh, in your, uh, before you started making these outdoor knives, which I I'm assuming now you use when you go out uh, camping and hunting. Uh, but what, before you were making them, whose knives were you carrying? What kind of knives inspired you? I was carrying a lot of Benchmade, a lot of Kershaw's, a lot of stuff like that. I never, you know, it's funny because I was never like a giant knife collector before I got into this. Cause with most of my stuff, I, you know, I'll buy a couple good quality things and that's what I've learned. It's like, you know, you buy it right once and you're good and i just want the tool to work and that's kind of you know carried over into my own designs i think we're like i don't always use the flashiest stuff but it's all good quality gear and it's gonna work when you need it to so that's kind of where my mindset kind of stuck with it okay so you called yourself an internet baby uh, or a youtube baby when it comes to uh learning about knives and stuff so how how did that work uh, in terms of um kind of choosing the steels and figuring out uh, heat treat, you know, that's something that you can read about. That's something that you can watch videos about, but uh, I would also imagine that there is a great deal of feel to that. So how did you 
develop the skills and how long did it take you? Uh, I did a very simple thing of screwing up a lot. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how I really learned. Um, cause you learn something like heat treating. You're like, Oh, that was too hot. And I cooked that thing. And that's all cracked up and everything. And even just certain grinds where you take something too thin or you take something too thick. It's a lot of trial and error. And, um, I actually do have a lot of people that help me out now too, that I work with that. Like I'll send them a knife or two and be like, why do you think of this? And that's what really helped my game a lot. Mm -hmm. I was getting opinions from guys that are really steel nerds or are really knife nerds. I'm just some, you know, goon in his garage making stuff. But I would send it to them and be like, hey, tweak this, dial this. And I'm like, all right, cool. I could, you know. And then that's how I really help refine everything. Because I always knew like the gist, but it was getting to those finer details, which really make the world a difference. So were those, uh, these are knife nerds, steel nerds you're talking about. Yes. Um, what, what about, uh, what about uh, other outdoorsmen or uh, f uh, your police friends or other people? Did you uh, do you get your hands? Or, I'm sorry. Do you get your knives in the hands of those people to do real world uh, testing? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who uh, are out in the bush a whole lot more than me. I actually joke around that now I end up spending all my time making stuff for people who are doing the things I want to do because um, I'm currently making the things for them. And uh, hopefully that's changing now since I'm only working one full-time job. So I do plan yeah. on getting out a lot more now. So what kind of what kind of feedback is or has been the most helpful from those people that, that have been using your knives in a practical way? So really the grind has helped out a lot. Grind and handle ergonomics um, because mm. it really does matter how it sits in your hand. Like even specifically with the Scandi grind, this is, you know, like I said, I'm far from a nerd, and I've learned that I'm not really one to get into the debates of everything. I just tell people what I do, and then that that's it. That's you know, you guys can debate it from there. So with my scanning grinds, it's really hard to see in the light. But you see that there's a slight polish at the bottom of the bevel right there. Yeah. So I'm hitting that on my leather belt on the two by seventy two at a pretty acute angle. Some people will say that's creating a micro bevel. Um uh, this is where it gets into the world of debates of everything. I don't think it's a, removing enough material to create a secondary bevel because I've done it with the Scandi grind and then taking on a really like high grip belt and just slightly going over the edge a little bit more because it does help it. You know, Scandi grinds, they have very fine edges because it goes to an acute point. Yeah. So I think with that hard buff on the leather belt and giving that little polish right there, it helps toughen up the edge a little bit. And that took a lot of uh, fine tuning between whether I wanted to actually hit it on a belt and do a micro bevel. Because I know there's guys like LT Wright who actually, and I believe Bark River does it too, where they actually hit it on, I believe, a buffing wheel pretty hard the same way to kind of create more of a secondary bevel to it. Yeah, Tops does that with their Scandies, I know. And, and, uh, and I remember when they first started doing it with their brothers of bushcraft knife which was kind of their their entree into that sort of bushcraft knife uh there was a big hue and cry about the fact that uh oh my gosh is that a secondary edge on that and and i think someone maybe it was craig uh said the same thing look you know we we pride ourselves on you know some of the toughest knives around yeah therefore our scandy ground knives you know we need to we need to do a little bit of that so that they don't break <laughs> but you all still get the benefit exactly and but that's you know people could debate these things all day long and that's what makes for great internet forums however i just know that this works pretty well and i'm very happy with the results and it i personally think having that hard buff on there helps the edge just hold up a little bit because that's where some of these guys will help me out because I would send them like one of each and be like, just beat them up. Let me know. Like I have a couple guys out with them right now. We're still doing testing on a couple of new knives. And it's nice because, you know, that's what they love to do. And I'm like, all right, good. It gives me time to stay in the shop and keep working because I still test them all myself. But it's nice to have just different opinions out there because, you know, it's just like anybody else. You have a, like a second or third set of eyes on something. They may see something that you don't and vice versa. Right. And they might put it through tests that you didn't even think of you know things exactly. that uh, 
or rigors that that need to be tested. So so doing these uh, these kind of camp knives with the uh, um, uh, well, first of all, uh, before we get to those, I, show me the the knife that you were holding up. Um, that looks really nice. So remember that little really guy up that. there that you were talking about that that little EDC fixie. This yeah. is based off of that. So that little knife is called the EDN. That I recently, if you go to Knives by Nuge on Instagram, you have the little black micarta with the flared copper tubes. This is the big brother to that one. So we essentially made the blade 3.5 inches on it, and we extended the handle a little bit and changed up the curve because this, that's one of those things where like you can't just extend it on CAD because the feel is completely different. So I did have to do some adjustments by hand to get it so your hand really fits in there well. And uh, with this knife specifically, this is only in uh, 1084 because it's a prototype. Um, as you can see, I've been using it every single day. But because um, we burn wood to heat the house, so I'm literally using a knife every morning and every evening oh, to make sure the fire's going. Um, and we're going to be doing these as a first for me in CPM 3V, which I'm stoked about. Oh, nice. So that's... So I'm really happy about that. So does that mean um, that you have to buy a whole bunch more belts and kind of prepare yourself differently to work that steel than what you're what you have in the past? I am scared because I don't know. Uh, well, like everything else, I will figure it out when we get there. Thankfully, with the Scandi grinds, because it's such a short bevel on there, you really don't burn through too many belts. Um, right. which is, you know, a blessing because they're the most expensive part. But if I was, I have a couple of people that want this model in the flat grind. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to do some pre grinding on it beforehand, but you can't take it too far up because this is only three thirty second stock. Mm -hmm. And then it can get a little warpy if you take away too much material. So it's going to be that fine line. I actually had these, uh, all my stainless knives heat treated by Paul boss. And he oh, does nice. a great job of getting out any warp. Um, I, it's something with his cryo. Now, I don't want to say what he told me because, you know, I can't repeat it properly. However, <laughs> right. in his cryo, he's able to get out any warp possible. And I do appreciate it because it saves me a ton of time. Oh, so and, and that allows you to go thinner and to and to grind more preheat treat, which is easier. Yeah. Right. And And easier on the machines and such. Right. What he told me is that I could pretty much take it, I would say maybe 80% of the way, say if it's a flat grind, probably 80% of the way, as long as you have a flat section up there that goes up the majority of the knife, he can keep any kind of warp out of it. So, but if you go all the way up with the bevel, you don't, you'll lose that area. And then you're going to have that open air between the plate and the knife. And he's not going to have any flat surface uh -huh. to get that warp out. And, uh, but this time I'm going full thickness. It may I may be a giant regret, but we'll find out. You know, like I said, I learned by screwing up. That's pretty cool. I mean, Paul Boss he he does Bucks heat treat, and they're they're known for that. They're known yeah. for, um, and he gets a lot of uh, well, the Paul Boss heat treats uh, get a lot of mileage out of whatever those steels are. Um, so that's that's a pretty uh, that's a cool place to go not a cool place that's not the right word i'm trying to find that that's a that's a shrewd place for a new maker to go so that's yeah. something you don't have to worry about uh because he's he's the man um so making these knives uh the the large and the small um it's interesting you talk about you can't just extend it <clears throat> uh because the ergonomics change with the dimensional change and i've found uh over time, that's something I look at because I like small and large versions of knives and some designs, uh, like uh, some folders that I have, uh, you are able to just add, uh, you know, make it 10% larger and it works perfectly ergonomically. And then there are other things uh, that have that are way more subtle, like Spyderco knives, you can't do that with for some reason. They have to redesign. Other knives feel fine. So I, I think it's interesting that you paid attention to that because it's a it's a real issue. It, oftentimes, you can't just blow it up. Yeah, and it's you have to. I mean, it looks great on paper, but you need to do you need to get a little dirt time on the model, you know, before you like you know can actually start sending it out there. And that's what I've learned is that you got to play with things first and get things dialed. 
And then, you know, they get them out there. And then, too, you're still not done because there's still little subtle changes that you can make. Like something like uh, this is one of the little neck knives that I do, which also, you know, you can wear it as a, you know, pocket style knife. It's uh, I call it the Wicket. This is probably one of my more popular models. See if I can get that actually in the light. Um, but one thing I changed up here is this one is one of the older ones. This little bump right here, the little finger choil, it's fine for my hand, but I reference the baby hands that I have. I had a couple guys with gorilla hands grab a hold of this thing, and that actually created a hot spot for them right there, which I didn't realize. For me, I did a lot of testing on this model, and it beat it up all summer long. And uh, I thought it was perfect. But then I started sending it out there, and people are like, oh, I don't know about this little thing right here. So on all my newer models, we actually moved that back about three sixteenths of an inch, which now gives everybody, you know, a multitude of size hands, a more comfortable purchase on the knife. Yep, that's the guy. So that's all I had to cool. do is move it back just a smidge, and it made the world a difference. That is, uh, that's pretty interesting. How just a subtle, tiny little subtle change can make a huge difference. And and now you're going from camp knives, uh, and you're also doing. Uh, kitchen knives and to me that's a huge difference i mean there there i'm sure there's a lot of subtlety there too but uh, you're you're talking about going from scandy grinds basically to full height flat grinds on very thin stock that's also very broad um what what was it like going from and and i'm making an assumption now that you started with the camp knives i could be wrong but what's it like switching back and forth between those two different uh styles of uh, blade grinding it's a trip um because <laughs> you're almost like every if you do too many outdoor knives and then switch back to the culinary knives you're almost like a relearning it um i gave myself a doozy this past week because i was working on a couple of scandy grinds and then i decided to throw into the mix a uh, fillet knife that i just finished up mm. and um it's tough because you're talking about going from a thicker stock bush crafting knife to a super thin, super bendy, super flexible fillet knife. And uh, the grinding style is completely different. Um, and also just, you know, the way you have to grind is different. This thing, you're really, you're really cutting it close with your thumbs. Every now and then I feel like my thumb gets a little bit shorter with these guys. Where on the Scandi grinds, I'm actually using a jig to make sure I get those perfect angles because it really matters there. When you're doing a full flat grind, you have some wiggle room. You have the feel you could go with while you're going across the belt. I do all those freehand. Same with my sabers because you can really feel it better. But you also have some more like oops room when you're working on it. With the Scandi grind, if I've tried freehanding them. It's it's tough. It's really tough to do. And uh, I'm trying to get production speed up. So if I could do the flat grinds by hand very fast, that's the way I'm going to do it. If I need to use a jig on the Scandies, and you know, by all means, I'll use a jig. So. Little tool uh, help. with the um, with the fillet knives, it, you know, being especially thin and flexible. Do you grind those after you have that uh, heat treated? How does that work? I grind them from full heat treat. Um, so because they're fairly thin anyway, and if you use good aggressive belts, you could actually get to the material pretty fast. And I've figured out that the flex it isn't just from the heat treat alone. It's also about where you remove the material where I want more of like a tip mid flex with my fillet knives. So you can see probably a little bit better in this way. You see where it bends yeah. right there in the middle. I keep it fairly thicker going a little bit back here because where you're flexing it is going to be up and towards the tip. So when you're grinding it, you pay a little, you know, you get a good amount of grinding there and then you can hold it a little bit longer there and focus on the spot where you want the flex to be. Because wherever you do more of that grinding, that's where you're removing more material. That's where the flex is going to end up. Wow, I, that sounds nerve wracking. I mean, just, uh, I mean, just the, even doing a full flat grind uh, seems like nerve wracking because, um, you know, if your angles are off, you're going to see. But <clears throat> I've heard from a number of people that doing it freehand and just kind of getting the feel for it is the way to go. Um, uh, when you when you make a kitchen knife, are you spending different attention to the beauty of it because you're imagining it in a kitchen? Uh, some of the handles look uh, uh, really, you know, very very nice on the culinary hand, um, knives. So yeah, those uh, I actually take them up to a higher polish than I do my outdoor knives 
mainly because of the environment they're going to be in. Um, most of the time, you're going to be in a pretty controlled environment where you're not going to be as worried about it. And also, a lot of these are show pieces. I mean, nobody needs a $400 chef knife. They want a $400 chef knife. And, you know, God bless them because I have a couple of nice show pieces that I keep up on my knife rack. And it's just nice to, you know, have that pretty piece that you could really, you know, cherish. They're absolute workhorses, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I try to take it up to that next level or even on like something like this fillet knife. I actually, normally I like to polish G Carter like this, but it's on a fillet knife. It's going to be on the side of a boat. You know, mm -hmm. I want to make sure my buddy Pete has a good grip on this thing. So, like, it still looks gorgeous, but it still has that grip, especially once it starts getting wet because you're in an environment where it's not as uh, nice as just dropping on the cutting board in your house. Right. Well, what what kind of cooking do you do and what what do you look for? What is the ideal kitchen knife for you? So I would kind of like more like a Western style chef knife. Um, and it depends on what size I do it with. Like my eight inch chef knife, I keep it a little bit thicker behind the edge just because that's going to be more of a workhorse. Where then with my six inch, I take it super, super fine just so it like will glide through most of the vegetables and the fruits and everything that I'm cooking. And, you know, I've got a, you know, a very, I wouldn't say I'm a chef, not by any means, but I do enjoy to cook. I do a lot of wild game cooking too, as you can imagine, because that's, you know, the majority of the proteins that I eat. And uh, that I've figured out how to, like the boning style knife that I do. It's a, it's a little bit of a smaller version of my fillet knife. And you had to learn by actually getting in there, getting the curves, but it's tough to do those because you're hitting bone. So you got to make sure I try to do a convex edge on those guys instead of just a V edge like I do on most of my knives. Just because I know that's going to be bashing into bone all the time. And that convex edge is is more rounded. Sometimes it's called an apple seed edge, and that makes it a little bit more robust, right? Yep. But I fact I figured with most of my culinary knives, I mean. I think a lot of people end up like using the basic sharpeners or the guy to sharpen like a work sharp or something else like that. It just keeps it very easy and simple because, you know, that's what people really want. They just want it, you know, they just want it to work and they just want it to be easy to sharpen. I've learned that from most of the average customers that I have. Uh, you know, you, you were talking about how um, uh, some of these chef's knives that you make uh, might be considered wall hangers. They're, they're a little bit more expensive they're larger, they're, uh, you know, maybe not going to be someone's bang around uh, daily driver in the kitchen. But I say, I say, uh, and this is a brand new uh, thought for me because I just got my first uh, custom kitchen knife uh, like two weeks ago. And I'm shocked. I have a I, I have a giant collection of knives that only get appreciated. And then I have a, a decent set of kitchen knives that get used <laughs> daily and have for the last 15 years, you know. And uh, it just sort of occurred to me, what am I doing? I need I need a couple of really nice, uh, you know, kitchen knives. And it has made a tremendous difference. And to me, if you're going to spend that money on a custom, that's the stuff, you know, how people get on your case when you're a knife collector about not using your knives. Well, that's the expensive knife you definitely uh, should be using. Well, it makes a world of difference, too, because you realize, you know, oh, that's how it's supposed to work. That's actually when my girlfriend first moved in with me and she started using some of my knives and she's like, oh, that's that's how they cut. You don't just smush the tomato. It's supposed to slice. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've I've had people, um, you know, uh, comment that the knives are too sharp not not uh, you know just when i've handed people knives you know this is this is too sharp I'm like what are you used to cutting with <laughs> you know, pry bar yeah exactly um, that's always my favorite comment and it's like i never want people to hurt themselves but they're like yeah your knife cuts cuts real well because you know they might have been not using the best technique and uh you know red stuff gets on the cutting board and it's you know oops but you learn you know very quickly how like you know a good quality knife with good edge geometry is actually supposed to work. So do you, in your experience, uh, as a, as a, um, you know, a culinary enthusiast, have you found that knives, uh, that you buy at Bed Bath & Beyond, whatever your Henkels, your, your Vostoffs and stuff, do you think that they're, um, thicker behind the edge than need be, or, or, or just, you know, kind of built for, for banging around year after year or, and not maybe so refined? What, what are your opinions? 
It's uh, for me, I don't think so, because look at the audience that it's going to. Not everybody is going to fully understand edge geometry and, you know, what you could use for what, you know, because I've seen edge geometry on EDC knives that I think is too thin. But this is coming from me with like an outdoor thing because it's great for going straight forward. But the second you start carving and putting that other like lateral directional pressure on there, that's how you could chip it pretty easily because of the edge geometry. And then you also look at what the average person is doing in a kitchen. They're probably banging around the knife, not using it properly, throwing it in the bottom of the kitchen sink and probably put it in the dishwasher. All things which are like gigantic no-nos. Now, with those knives, you kind of want them to be because if somebody was to handle like, say like my six-inch chef knife and they were to bang it around, my neighbor down the road, they, I love them, but the wife always uses it on the butter dish and the butter dish has rounded ceramic edges and it comes back looking like a bread knife because the edge is so fine but when it gets pushed and rolled against that ceramic lip on the butter tray it chips it so maybe sometimes you wouldn't mind having that thicker edge because you wouldn't be chipping it as often you might be dulling it but you won't be removing the metal completely from the picture right and and therefore changing the entire profile when you fix it exactly and then you're going up there anyway so it you know, it really depends. And because they have their higher end line, which I'm sure has much better geometry. But the people buying that are also looking for that, you know? Right, it, right. I feel like when you talk to a lot of everyday people that aren't, you know, knife junkies necessarily, they uh, they don't understand. They don't never heard of edge geometry. They just want sure. the knife that works. And, you know, they'll realize what works and what doesn't. And also they'll realize, why is this so chippy? I don't like this. And then get something a little thicker behind the edge. I think that people like uh, on the whole just want a knife that stays sharp forever uh, in terms of kitchen knives because they're not thinking about it. It is their, you know, it's it's a it's a tool uh, means to an end and and they take uh, uh, rightly so they've got their own interests. They are not knife junkies, but, you know, it's just a way to cut and get their meal on the table. And uh, so as long as I can cut this, I mean, I, I know people plenty of people who have given away knives uh, or were ready to give away knives to me because the edge is gone. I'm like, I could just sharpen this for you and you could have it back and use it. And they're like, really? Yeah. It's like, yeah. That's how this works. <laughs> yeah. These are supposed to be sharpened. Yeah. But, uh, it's, it's funny because, you know, some people are just another tool that they don't even realize they're using. I mean, I was at my family's house for Thanksgiving and they were carving the turkey with the go classic Cutco. And I could tell that it was quite dull. But you know what my uncle did? He just applied more force. So, uh, you know, it, yeah. it's just it's just a tool to them. They're not really thinking about it like we are. But we're I feel like we think of them more as like performance items where other people are just another thing in the drawer. So yeah. that's kind yeah. of where the difference is. I've heard I've heard things boiled down to um uh tools or obstacles for people. You know, it's it's either, you know, people included, you're either a tool for me or an obstacle for me. And and uh, if you're an obstacle. That just means I can't use you right now. You know, and that's how people might see things like knives and other tools. You know, this, this is just a thing. And uh, I can't imagine it because I spend so much time uh, and, and effort and money uh, on this hobby or on this collection. I mean, to me, the, the word hobby kind of doesn't even doesn't even approach it but um yeah i mean it's not it's not everyone's thing and not everyone's gonna spend 400 bucks on it's a kitchen knife but but if they do they should use it well it's i realized too is a lot of people that because when i first started out i didn't have like a big knife enthusiast customer base they were you know they just thought that would be neat to try it out and mm -hmm. um you know i would talk to them about the uses of it and then we would buy it and it would be like the realization, like, oh, my God, that's how that's supposed to function. And then that's also how then you get more repeat customers with it because they learn to appreciate it and how well it's supposed to actually work. And then they realize what they were doing before was, you know, <laughs> it was not working out the way it's supposed to. Because like I said with my girlfriend, you're like, oh, that's how that works. You know, so sometimes you need to actually put the quality tool in their hand to make them appreciate it. Right, right, right. And 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 stop with all the weird knife talk and just let the knife speak for itself. Um, exactly. It just I mean, that's, 
Yeah, that that's a that's advice I could take from myself. So for you and and knives by Nuge, what is more? Um, what are people coming uh, to you for more? The kitchen or the camp or the EDC? I would say right now I am more camp and going actually further into the EDC realm. To be honest, I wasn't planning on getting into the EDC realm. I always EDC my knives anyway, but that wasn't something that I was really focusing on first. But then I started having a lot of the EDC community reaching out to me about some of my smaller knives. I mean, even another very popular one that I do is called the Chickpea. And uh, I have one right here with a scandy grind and burlap my card on it. To be honest, when I designed this knife, what I had in mind was the Boy Scouts. I wanted to design a Boy Scout knife that was smaller, full tang, because they're always using those slip joints that I've seen countless scouts cut their fingers on because they never locked, they never were sharp. And I'm like, I wanted to make a more affordable, small, carryable fixed blade. And then everybody started to EDC this. And I'm like, that's not where I saw the market going. But um, Brian House from Housemade sometimes talk about saying, hey, let the market take it where it will. If the EDC community is about it, then that's what it is. Then go with it. But, you know, it's funny because it's not where my intention was, but that's what is now carrying it. So, Oh, man, I, I would say uh, absolutely. Like I said right up front, that's like a, 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 a big thing for me is how do I, uh, as a suburban guy living very close to a big urban center, uh, get away with carrying fixed blades around. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not carrying this around with me. Unfortunately, I'd love to have a Bowie on my hip all the time. But uh, so, what kind of knives make sense for daily carry? And and that has to do a lot with the design and how it, you know, just how it fits in the pocket or in the waistband. I like in the waistband carry personally. I know a lot of people love in the pocket with those little. Um, with the little leather pouches that have a, a place for your lighter and a place for your uh, flashlight yeah. and a pen. And, and that knife you were just holding up the chickpea could fit perfectly in there are um, uh, like knives ship free makes little pocket leather sheaths for little knives like that. And, and I think that's great. I think uh, I'm excited to see you succeeding with this because i i want more people to carry edc fixed blades and if they're you know if they're awesome made by you that's even better but uh, i think it's a great thing that uh that you're jumping on there yeah and one thing that i've found and this is also from my previous employment that i realize if you really want a discreet carry neck knife is probably the most discreet you can get because a lot of guys on the job know where to look for weapons. Um, obviously, that's just what keeps them safe. And uh, we all know what's on that pocket clip on that ulti clip, you know? So, yeah. uh, like, places like, say, and I am not saying break any laws. I am not saying follow whatever the local ordinances are. However, uh, neck knife carry just looks like a necklace on your neck. And if you got it tucked in there, you know, it's it's not as obvious. So if like if you're in a very urban area where knives are frowned upon and you still want to have something on you, that might be your best option. I am a big fan of neck knives. And also, um, I mean, you know, if if you set it up right, it can be a very easily accessible uh, tool or yeah. or self-defense weapon um, with both hands. That's that's a thing I think of. Uh, you know, in terms of self-defense, it's great if you land on the ground in such a way that you can reach your front right pocket, pull your knife and deploy it. That's great. But what if you land on that pocket? Not only are you going to, you know, break your hip, but you're going to have a nasty bruise and you're not going to be able to get to your knife. Um, I don't know. That's that's something I think about a lot. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, their mind exercises, really. But uh, a neck knife seems to solve many of those problems. Um, uh, where do you want to see Knives by Nudge? Nudge, Nudge. I do apologize. Where do you want to see Knives by Nudge uh, in the future? Where do you want to see this? What size do you want to see this grow to? And uh, what kind of production capability? I really want to up production. That's one thing I want to do. So right now I'm figuring out. I'm a one-man show. But since I realized that, I've learned to outsource certain things. Like something as simple as like heat treat for my stainless steel. I'm tomorrow morning. I'm sending out 104 knives to Paul Boss. Even if I had the kiln here to do all the stainless, that would still take about like probably at least four days to do by myself. Where he does it in like an hour. 
So, or whatever long it takes. He's pretty much got the big conveyor belt that does it. Um, so outsourcing certain things like having items water jet cut instead of me cutting them all out by hand, because then you get repeatability and uniformability. Another thing that I'm going to start dabbling into soon, I haven't really talked about it too much except to a couple people and now whoever listens to this. Um, I'm going to be coming out with the Wicket with CNC handle scales. So this is probably one of my most popular neck knives and pocket carry knives. And I would like to get – right now I don't take custom orders from them just because they sell out so quickly. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to get that CNC line of them where I would have a set of scales and then I would do all the blade work. And then I would just bolt on the handle scales. Sheets would be super easy to do because it will all be uniform. And, you know, I'll be able to get a more affordable option. Then in a couple of years, I'm hoping to have some people working for me. So uh, I'm not doing all this by myself. And uh, bigger space, more tools, more knives. You know, simple as that. Oh, right on. I, I love the idea of uh, I, of the water jetting and and the CNC handles for just repeatability. And then and then. And then how that will aid you in the Kydex making. Kydex can be such a pain, man. Uh, just, you know, I make Kydex for my own knives in my collection from time to time. And uh, yeah, just to be able to to have uh, one or two um, sample models that you just make the same Kydex, you know, use that as the same knife over and over without having to make it individual to each knife will speed things up. Uh, that all sounds that all sounds really good. And then, um, just as a tease, I have seen um, that you have a uh, that you're working on folders too. You have a friction folder that you have in the works, or that you have already released. I had a couple prototypes made. This is one of them, and that's why I was smiling when you were talking about the leather slip because I'm like, I had it in my pocket uh -huh. right now. <laughs> um, this is actually based off of my chickpea model. So pretty much the same size. The blade's a little bit shorter because you have to take the hand scales further up. So it's a very basic friction folder, 90 degree spine all the way up to the top. So you can actually scrape a ferro rod or fat wood with it closed like that. And um, it's going to come with an option to have the leather slip. That's made by Ryan over at Fail Safe Goods. So if you want one of those, you have to go to him. But uh, the production run, we're going to be doing them in Nitro V stainless. So this first batch we did in 1095. And uh, it's been working out great. I love the thing so far. Um, and the nice part about this guy is uh, friction folders, as you can imagine, a lot of people don't like because it doesn't have a lock. It, it's probably still safer than a slip joint, in my opinion, because you can actually put your thumb on the spine while you're working it. And we left that little hump up there. And right there, if you try to close it on your hand, if you have your hand all the way up in the finger choil, it's going to... You're going to hit that little choil right there before it ever gets close to the blade touching your hand. That's great. Not only that, but when you're using the knife properly, you're going against that stop pin. So that yep. shouldn't really even be an issue unless you're uh, doing some very rigorous activity in an emergency. But in that case, you're pinching it and you have the little finger guard. So exactly. that's 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 really cool. I love friction folders. And uh, actually, I would love to check that one out at some point. Um, well, uh, Tom, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure to meet you at last, uh, having seen especially a lot of, uh, you know, your EDC fixies that those are, like I said, those are what I fixate on these days. And, um, it's been a pleasure meeting you and I look forward to seeing how Knives by Nuge grows, uh, in the future. And those who are watching, who are patrons be sure to tune in we're gonna we're gonna continue this conversation and ask a couple of uh juicy questions as he mentioned uh earlier but uh tom again thanks again for joining us thank you for having me it's been a pleasure all right take care don't take dull for an answer it's the knife junkies favorite sign off phrase and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long sleeve tee and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a knife junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at the knifejunkie.com/dull and shop for all of your knife junkies merchandise at the knifejunkie.com/shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Nugent of Knives by Nuge. I'm excited, especially to check out that friction folder, but also those EDC fixed blades. Uh, you know how I feel about that, especially when they're stylishly done and uh, built with purpose. Uh, be sure to check us uh, again next Sunday for another great uh, interview. 
and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on uh, YouTube, Facebook or Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.